Chapter Seven of *The Hound of the Baskervilles* by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neville. Chapter Seven: The Stapletons of Merripit House. The fresh beauty of the following morning did something to efface from our minds the grim and grey impression which had been left upon both of us by our first experience of Baskerville Hall. As Sir Henry and I sat at breakfast, the sunlight flooded in through the high mullioned windows, throwing watery patches of colour from the coats of arms which covered them. The dark panelling glowed like bronze in the golden rays and it was hard to realize that this was indeed the chamber which had struck such a gloom into our souls upon the evening before. "'I guess it is ourselves and not the house that we have to blame,' said the baronet. "'We were tired with our journey and chilled by our drive, so we took a grey view of the place. Now we are fresh and well, so it is all cheerful once more.' yet it is not entirely a question of imagination i answered did you for example happen to hear some one a woman i think sobbing in the night that is curious for i did when i was half asleep fancy that i heard something of the sort i waited quite a time but there was no more of it so i concluded that it was all a dream i heard it distinctly and I am sure that it was really the sob of a woman. We must ask about this right away. He rang the bell, and asked Barrymore whether he could account for our experience. It seemed to me that the pallid features of the butler turned a shade paler still as he listened to his master's question. There are only two women in the house, Sir Henry, he answered. One is the scullery maid, who sleeps in the other wing. The other is my wife, and I can answer for it that the sound could not have come from her. And yet he lied as he said it, for it chanced that after breakfast I met Mrs. Barrymore in the long corridor with the sun full upon her face. She was a large, impassive, heavy-featured woman, with a stern, set expression of mouth. But her tell-tale eyes were red, and glanced at me from between swollen lids. It was she, then, who wept in the night, and if she did so, her husband must know it. Yet he had taken the obvious risk of discovery in declaring that it was not so. Why had he done this, and why did she weep so bitterly? Already round this pale-faced, handsome, black-bearded man there was gathering an atmosphere of mystery and of gloom. It was he who had been the first to discover the body of Sir Charles, and we had only his word for all the circumstances which led up to the old man's death. Was it possible that it was Barrymore, after all, whom we had seen in the cab in Regent Street? The beard might well have been the same. The cabman had described a somewhat shorter man, but such an impression might easily have been erroneous. How could I settle the point for him? Obviously, the first thing to do was to see the Grimpen postmaster, and find whether the test telegram had really been placed in Barrymore's own hands. Be the answer what it might, I should at least have something to report to Sherlock Holmes. Sir Henry had numerous papers to examine after breakfast, so that the time was propitious for my excursion. It was a pleasant walk of four miles along the edge of the moor leading me at last to a small grey hamlet, in which two larger buildings, which proved to be the inn and the house of Dr. Mortimer, stood high above the rest. The postmaster, who was also the village grocer, had a clear recollection of the telegram. "'Certainly, sir,' said he, "'I had the telegram delivered to Mr. Barrymore exactly as directed. Who delivered it? My boy here. James?' You delivered that telegram to Mr. Barrymore at the hall last week, did you not? Yes, father, I delivered it. Into his own hands, I asked. Well, he was up in the loft at the time, so that I could not put it into his own hands. But I gave it to Mrs. Barrymore's hands, and she promised to deliver it at once. Did you see Mr. Barrymore? No, sir, I tell you he was in the loft. 
If you didn't see him, how did you know he was in the law? Well, surely his own wife ought to know where he is, said the postmaster testily. Didn't he get the telegram? If there is any mistake, it is for Mr. Barrymore himself to complain. It seemed hopeless to pursue the inquiry any farther, that it was clear that in spite of Holmes's ruse we had no proof that Barrymore had not been in London all the time. Suppose it were so. Suppose that the same man had been the last who had seen Sir Charles alive, and the first to dog the new heir when he returned to England. What then? Was he the agent of others, or had he some sinister design of his own? What interest could he have in persecuting the Baskerville family? I thought of the strange warning clipped out of the leading article of the Times. Was that his work, or was it possibly the doing of someone who was bent upon counteracting his schemes? The only conceivable motive was that which had been suggested by Sir Henry, that if the family could be scared away, a comfortable and permanent home would be secured for the Barrymore. But surely such an explanation as that would be quite inadequate to account for the deep and subtle scheming which seemed to be weaving an invisible net round the young baronet. Holmes himself had said that no more complex case had come to him in all the long series of his sensational investigations. I prayed, as I walked back along the grey, lonely road, that my friend might soon be freed from his preoccupations and able to come down to take this heavy burden of responsibility from my shoulder. Suddenly my thoughts were interrupted by the sound of running feet behind me, and by a voice which called me by name. I turned, expecting to see Dr. Mortimer, but to my surprise it was a stranger who was pursuing me. He was a small, slim, clean-shaven, prim-faced man, flaxen-haired and lean-jawed, between thirty and forty years of age, dressed in a grey suit and wearing a straw hat. A tin box for botanical specimens hung over his shoulder, and he carried a green butterfly net in one of his hands. "'You will, I am sure, excuse my presumption, Dr. Watson,' said he, as he came panting up to where I stood. "'Here on the moor we are homely folk, and do not wait for formal introductions.' You may possibly have heard my name from our mutual friend, Mortimer. I am Stapleton, of Merriman House. Your net and box would have told me as much, said I, for I knew that Mr. Stapleton was a naturalist. But how did you know me? I had been calling on Mortimer, and he pointed you out to me from the window of his surgery as you passed. As our road lay the same way, I thought that I would overtake you and introduce myself. I trust that Sir Henry is none the worse for his journey. He is very well, thank you. We were all rather afraid that, after the sad death of Sir Charles, the new baronet might refuse to live here. It is asking much of a wealthy man to come down and bury himself in a place of this kind, but I need not tell you that it means a very great deal to the countryside. Sir Henry has, I suppose, no superstitious fears in the matter. I do not think that is likely. Of course you know the legend of the fiend dog which hunts the family. I have heard it. It is extraordinary how credulous the peasants are about here. Any number of them are ready to swear that they have seen such a creature upon the moor. He spoke with a smile, but I seemed to read in his eyes that he took the matter more seriously. The story took a great hold upon the imagination of Sir Charles, and I had no doubt that it led to his tragic end. But now, his nerves were so worked up that the appearance of any dog might have had a fatal effect upon his diseased heart. I fancy that he really did see something of the kind upon that last night in the yew alley. I feared that some disaster might occur for I was very fond of the old man, and I knew that his heart was weak. How did you know that? Oh, my friend Mortimer told me. Do you think, then, that some dog pursued Sir Charles, and that he died of fright in consequence? Have you any better explanation? I have not come to any conclusion. 
Has Mr. Sherlock Holmes? The words took away my breath for an instant, but a glance at the placid face and steadfast eyes of my companion showed that no surprise was intended. It is useless for us to pretend that we do not know you, Dr. Watson, said he. The records of your detective have reached us here, and you could not celebrate him without being known yourself. When Mortimer told me your name, he could not deny your identity. If you are here, then it follows that Mr. Sherlock Holmes is interesting himself in the matter, and I am naturally curious to know what view he may take. I am afraid that I cannot answer that question. May I ask if he is going to honor us with a visit himself? He cannot leave town at present. He has other cases which engage his attention. What a pity! He might throw some light on that which is so dark to us. But, as to your own researches, if there is any possible way which I can be of service to you, I trust that you will command me. If I had any indication of the nature of your suspicions, or how you propose to investigate the case, I might perhaps even now give you some aid or advice. I assure you that I am simply here upon a visit to my friend, Sir Henry, that I need no help of any kind. Excellent, said Stapleton. You are perfectly right to be wary and discreet. I am justly reproved for what I feel was an injustifiable intrusion, and I promise you that I will not mention the matter again. We had come to a point where a narrow grassy path struck off from the road and wound away across the moor. A steep, boulder-sprinkled hill lay upon the right, which had in bygone days been cut into a granite quarry. The face, which was turned upwards towards us, formed a dark cliff, with ferns and brambles growing in its niches. From over a distant rise there floated a grey plume of smoke. "'A moderate walk along this moor-path brings us to Merripit House,' said he. "'Perhaps you will spare an hour that I may have the pleasure of introducing you to my sister.' My first thought was that I should be by Sir Henry's side. But then I remembered the pile of papers and bills with which his study-table was littered. It was certain that I could not help with those, and Holmes had expressly said that I should study the neighbours upon the moor. I accepted Stapleton's invitation, and returned together down the path. "'It is a wonderful place, the moor,' said he, looking round over the undulating downs, long green rollers with crests of jagged granite foaming up into fantastic surges. "'You never tire of the moor. You cannot think the wonderful secrets which it contains. It is so vast and so barren and so mysterious.' "'You know it well, then.' "'I have only been here two years. The residents would call me a newcomer. We came shortly after Sir Charles settled but my tastes led me to explore every part of the country around, and I should think that there are few men who know it better than I do. Is it hard to know? Very hard. You see, for example, this great plain to the north here, with the queer hills breaking out of it. Do you observe anything remarkable about that? It would be a rare place for a gallop. You would naturally think so and the thought has cost several their lives before now. You notice these bright green spots scattered thickly over it? Yes, they seem more fertile than the rest. Stapleton laughed. Oh, that is the great Grimpen Mire, said he. A false step yonder means death to a man or beast. Only yesterday I saw one of the moor ponies wander into it. He never came out. I saw his head for quite a long time craning out of the bog-hole, but it sucked him down at last. Even in dry seasons it is a danger to cross it, but after these autumn rains it is an awful place. And yet I can find my way to the very heart of it and return alive. By George, there is another of those miserable ponies. Something brown was rolling and tossing among the green sedges. Then a long, agonized, writhing neck shot upward, and a dreadful cry echoed over the moor. 
It turned me cold with horror, but my companion's nerves seemed to be stronger than mine. It's gone, said he. The mire has him. Two in two days, and many more, perhaps, for they get in the way of going there in the dry weather, and never know the difference until the mire has them in its clutches. It's a bad place, the great Grimpen Mire. And you say you can penetrate it? Yes, there are one or two paths which a very active man can take. I have found them out. But why should you wish to go into so horrible a place? Well, you see the hills beyond? They are really islands cut off on all sides by the impassable mire which has crawled round them in the course of the years. That is where the rare plants and the butterflies are, if you have the wit to reach them. I shall try my luck some day. He looked at me with a surprised face. For God's sake, put such an idea out of your mind, said he. Your blood would be upon my head. I assure you that there would not be the least chance of your coming back alive. It is only by remembering certain complex landmarks that I am able to do it. Hello, I cried. What is that? A long, low moan, indescribably sad, swept over the moor. It filled the whole air, and yet it was impossible to say whence it came. From a dull murmur it swelled into a deep roar, and then sank back into a melancholy, throbbing murmur once again. Stapleton looked at me with a curious expression in his face. "'Queer place, the moor,' said he. "'But what is it? Aren't the peasants say it is the hound of the Baskervilles calling for its prey? I've heard it once or twice before, but never quite so loud. I looked round, with a chill of fear in my heart, at the huge swelling plain mottled with the green patches of rushes. Nothing stirred over the vast expanse save a pair of ravens, which croaked loudly from a tor behind us. "'You are an educated man. You don't believe such nonsense as that,' said I. "'What do you think is the cause of so strange a sound?' "'Bogs make queer noises sometimes. It's the mud settling, or, or the water rising, or something.' "'No, no. That was a living voice.' "'Well, perhaps it was. Did you ever hear a bittern booming?' "'No, I never did.' It's a very rare bird, practically extinct in England now. But all things are possible upon the moor. Yes, I should not be surprised to learn that what we have heard is the cry of the last of the bitterns. It's the weirdest, strangest thing that ever I heard in my life. Yes, it's rather an uncanny place altogether. Look at the hillside yonder. What do you make of those? The whole steep slope was covered with grey circular rings of stone, a score of them, at least. What are they? Sheep pens? Oh, no, they are the homes of our worthy ancestors. Prehistoric man lived thickly on the moor. And as no one in particular has lived there since, we find all his little arrangements exactly as he left them. These are his wigwams, with the roofs off. You can even see his hearth and his couch, if you have the curiosity to go inside. But it is quite a town. When was it inhabited? Neolithic man. No day. What did he do? He grazed his cattle on these slopes, and he learned to dig for tin when the bronze sword began to supersede the stone axe. Look at the great trench in the opposite hill. That is his mark. Yes, you will find some very singular points about the moor, Dr. Watson. Oh, excuse me an instant. It is surely Cyclopides. A small fly or moth had fluttered across our path, and in an instant Stapleton was rushing with extraordinary energy and speed in pursuit of it. To my dismay, the creature flew straight for the great mire, and my acquaintance never paused for an instant bounding from tuft to tuft behind it, 
his green net waving in the air. His gray clothes and jerky zigzag irregular progress made him not unlike some huge moth himself. I was standing, watching his pursuit, with a mixture of admiration for his extraordinary activity, and fear, lest he should lose his footing in the treacherous mire, when I heard the sound of steps, and turning round found a woman near me upon the path. She had come from the direction in which the plume of smoke indicated the position of Merripit House, but the dip of the moor had hid her until she was quite close. I could not doubt that this was the Miss Stapleton of whom I had been told, since ladies of any sort must be few upon the moor, and I remembered that I had heard someone describe her as being a beauty. The woman who approached me was certainly that, and of a most uncommon type there could not have been a greater contrast between brother and sister, for Stapleton was neutral-tinted, with light hair and grey eyes, while she was darker than any brunette whom I have seen in England, slim, elegant, and tall. She had a proud, finely cut face, so regular that it might have seemed impassive were it not for the sensitive mouth and the beautiful dark eager eyes. With her perfect figure and elegant dress, she was indeed a strange apparition upon a lonely moorland path. Her eyes were on her brother as I turned, and then she quickened her pace towards me. I had raised my hat and was about to make some explanatory remark, when her own words turned all my thoughts into a new channel. "'Go back,' she said. "'Go straight back to London, instantly.' I could only stare at her in stupid surprise. Her eyes blazed at me, and she tapped the ground impatiently with her foot. "'Why should I go back?' I asked. "'I cannot explain,' she spoke in a low, eager voice, with a curious lisp in her utterance. "'But for God's sake, do what I ask you. Go back and never set foot upon the moor again.' "'But I have only just come.' "'Man, man!' she cried. "'Can you not tell when a warning is for your own good? "'Go back to London. "'Start to-night. "'Get away from this place at all costs. "'Hush! "'My brother is coming. "'Not a word of what I have said. "'Would you mind getting that orchid for me "'among the mare's tails yonder? "'We are very rich in orchids on the moor, "'though, of course, you are rather late "'to see the beauties of the place.' Stapleton had abandoned the chase, and came back to us breathing hard and flushed with his exertions. "'Hello, Beryl,' said he, and it seemed to me that the tone of his greeting was not altogether a cordial one. "'Well, Jack, you are very hot.' "'Yes, I was chasing a Cyclopides. He is very rare, and seldom found in the late autumn. What a pity that I should have missed him.' He spoke unconcernedly, but his small light eyes glanced incessantly from the girl to me. "'You have introduced yourselves, I can see.' "'Yes. I was telling Sir Henry that it was rather late for him to see the true beauties of the moor. Why, who do you think this is? I imagine it must be Sir Henry Baskerville.' "'No, no,' said I. "'Only a humble commoner, but his friend.' "'My name is Dr. Watson.' A flush of vexation passed over her expressive face. "'We have been talking at cross-purposes,' said she. "'Why, you had not very much time for talk,' my brother remarked with the same questioning eyes. "'I talked as if Dr. Watson were a resident instead of being merely a visitor,' said she. "'It cannot much matter to him whether it is early or late for the orchids.' "'But you will come on, will you not, and see Merripit House?' A short walk brought us to it. A bleak moorland house, once the farm of some grazier in the old prosperous days, but now put into repair and turned into a modern dwelling. An orchard surrounded it, but the trees, as is usual upon the moor, were stunted and nipped, and the effect of the whole place was mean and melancholy. We were admitted by a strange, wizened, rusty-coated old manservant, who seemed in keeping with the house. 
Inside, however, there were large rooms furnished with an elegance in which I seemed to recognize the taste of the lady. As I looked from their windows at the interminable granite-flecked moor rolling unbroken to the farthest horizon, I could not but marvel at what could have brought this highly educated man and this beautiful woman to live in such a place. Queer spot to choose, is it not? As if in answer to my thought and yet we manage to make ourselves fairly happy do we not beryl quite happy said she but there was no ring of conviction in her words i had a school said stapleton it was in the north country the work to a man of my temperament was mechanical and uninteresting but the privilege of living with youth of helping to mould those young minds and of impressing them with one's own character and ideals was very dear to me. However, the fates were against us. A serious epidemic broke out in the school, and three of the boys died. It never recovered from the blow, and much of my capital was irretrievably swallowed up. And yet, if it were not for the loss of the charming companionship of the boys, I could rejoice over my own misfortune, for, with my strong tastes for botany and zoology, I found an unlimited field of work here, and my sister is as devoted to nature as I am. All this, Dr. Watson, has been brought upon your head by your expression, as you surveyed the moor out of our window. It certainly did cross my mind that it might be a little dull, less for you, perhaps, than for your sister. No, no, I am never dull, said she quickly. Oh, we have books, we have our studies, and we have interesting neighbors. Dr. Mortimer is a most learned man in his own line. Poor Sir Charles was also an admirable companion. We knew him well, and miss him more than I can tell. Do you think that I should intrude if I were to call this afternoon and make the acquaintance of Sir Henry? I am sure that he would be delighted. Then perhaps you would mention that I propose to do so. We may, in our humble way, do something to make things more easy for him until he becomes accustomed to his new surroundings. Will you come upstairs, Dr. Watson, and inspect my collection of Lepidoptera? I think it is the most complete one in the southwest of England. By the time that you have looked through them, lunch will be almost ready. But I was eager to get back to my charge the melancholy of the moor, the death of the unfortunate pony, the weird sound which had been associated with the grim legend of the Baskervilles, all these things tinged my thoughts with sadness. Then, on the top of these, more or less vague impressions, there had come the definite and distinct warning of Miss Stapleton, delivered with such intense earnestness that I could not doubt that some grave and deep reason lay behind it. I resisted all pressure to stay for lunch, and set off at once upon my return journey, taking the grass-grown path by which we had come. It seems, however, that there must have been some shortcut for those who knew it, for before I had reached the road I was astounded to see Miss Stapleton sitting upon a rock by the side of the track. Her face was beautifully flushed with her exertions, and she held her hand to her side. I, I, I have run all the way in order to cut you off, Dr. Watson, said she. I had not even time to put on my hat. I must not stop, or my brother may miss me. I wanted to say to you how sorry I am about the stupid mistake I made in thinking that you were Sir Henry. Please forget the words I said, which have no application whatever to you. But I cannot forget them, Miss Stapleton, said I. I am Sir Henry's friend, and his welfare is a very close concern of mine. Tell me why it was that you were so eager that Sir Henry should return to London. A woman's whim, Dr. Watson. When you know me better, you will understand that I cannot always give reasons for what I say or do. No, no. I remember the thrill in your voice. I remember the look in your eyes. Please, please be frank with me, Miss Stapleton, for ever since I have been here I have been conscious of shadows all around me. Life has become like that great Grimpen Mire, 
with great green patches everywhere into which one may sink, and with no guide to point the track. Tell me, then, what it was that you meant, and I will promise to convey your warning to Sir Henry. An expression of irresolution passed for an instant over her face, but her eyes had hardened again when she answered me. "'You make too much of it, Dr. Watson,' said she. "'My brother and I were very much shocked by the death of Sir Charles. We knew him very intimately, for his favourite walk was over the moor to our house. He was deeply impressed with the curse which hung over the family, and when this tragedy came I naturally felt that there must be some grounds for the fears which he had expressed.' I was distressed, therefore, when another member of the family came down to live here, and I felt that he should be warned of the danger which he will run. That was all which I intended to convey. But what is the danger? You know the story of the hound? I do not believe in such nonsense. But I do. If you have any influence with Sir Henry, take him away from a place which has always been fatal to his family. The world is wide. Why should he wish to live at the place of danger? Because it is the place of danger. That is Sir Henry's nature. I fear that unless you can give me some more definite information than this, it would be impossible to get him to move. I cannot say anything definite, for I do not know anything definite. I would ask you one more question, Miss Stapleton. If you meant no more than this when you first spoke to me, why should you not wish your brother to overhear what you said? There is nothing to which he or any one else could object. My brother is very anxious to have the hall inhabited, for he thinks it is for the good of the poor folk upon the moor. He would be very angry if he knew that I have said anything which might induce Sir Henry to go away. But I have done my duty now. And I will say no more. I must get back, or he will miss me and suspect that I have seen you. Good-bye." She turned and had disappeared in a few minutes among the scattered boulders, while I, with my soul full of vague fears, pursued my way to Baskerville Hall. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of the Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Newfound. Chapter Eight. First Report of Doctor Watson. From this point onward, I will follow the course of events by transcribing my own letters to Mister Sherlock Holmes, which lie before me on the table. One page is missing, but otherwise they are exactly as written, and show my feelings and suspicions of the moment more accurately than my memory, clear as it is upon these tragic events, can possibly do. Paskerville Hall, October 13th. My dear Holmes, my previous letters and telegrams have kept you pretty well up to date as to all that has occurred in this most God-forsaken corner of the world. The longer one stays here, the more does the spirit of the moor sink into one's soul, its vastness and also its grim charm. When you are once out upon its bosom, you have left all traces of modern England behind you. But on the other hand, you are conscious everywhere of the homes and the work of the prehistoric people. On all sides of you, as you walk, are the houses of these forgotten folk, with their graves and their huge monoliths which are supposed to have marked their temples. As you look at their grey stone huts against the scarred hillsides, you leave your own age behind you. And if you were to see a skin-clad hairy man crawl out from the low door, fitting a flint-tipped arrow onto the string of his bow, you would feel that his presence there was more natural than your own. The strange thing is that they should have lived so thickly on what must always have been most unfruitful soil. I am no antiquarian, 
but I could imagine that they were some unwarlike and harried race who were forced to accept that which none other would occupy. All this, however, is foreign to the mission on which you set me, and will probably be very uninteresting to your severely practical mind. I can still remember your complete indifference as to whether the sun moved round the earth or the earth round the sun. Let me, therefore, return to the facts concerning Sir Henry Baskerville. If you have not had any report within the last few days, it is because up to today there was nothing of importance to relate. Then a very surprising circumstance occurred, which I shall tell you in due course. But, first of all, I must keep you in touch with some of the other factors in the situation. One of these, concerning which I have said little, is the escaped convict upon the moon. There is strong reason now to believe that he has got right away, which is a considerable relief to the lonely householders of this district. A fortnight has passed since his flight, during which he has not been seen, and nothing has been heard of him. It is surely inconceivable that he could have held out upon the moor during all that time. Of course, so far as his concealment goes, there is no difficulty at all. Any one of these stone huts would give him a hiding place. But there is nothing to eat, unless he were to catch and slaughter one of the moor sheep. We think, therefore, that he has gone, and the outlying farmers sleep the better in consequence. We are four able-bodied men in this household, so that we could take good care of ourselves but I confess that I have had uneasy moments when I have thought of the Stapletons. They live miles from any help. There are one maid, an old man-servant, the sister and the brother, the latter not a very strong man. They would be helpless in the hands of a desperate fellow like this Notting Hill criminal, if he could once effect an entrance. Both Sir Henry and I were concerned at their situation and it was suggested that Perkins, the groom, should go over to sleep there, but Stapleton would not hear of it. The fact is that our friend, the baronet, begins to display a considerable interest in our fair neighbour. It is not to be wondered at, for time hangs heavily in this lonely spot to an active man like him, and she is a very fascinating and beautiful woman. There is something tropical and exotic about her, which forms a singular contrast to her cool and unemotional brother. Yet he also gives the idea of hidden fires. He has certainly a very marked influence over her, for I have seen her continually glance at him as she talked, as if seeking approbation for what she said. I trust that he is kind to her. There is a dry glitter in his eyes, and a firm set of his thin lips, which goes with a positive and possibly a harsh nature. You would find him an interesting study. He came over to call upon Baskerville on that first day, and the very next morning he took us both to show us the spot where the legend of the wicked Hugo is supposed to have had its origin. It was an excursion of some miles across the moor to a place which is so dismal that it might have suggested the story. We found a short valley between rugged torrents, which led to an open grassy space flecked over with the white cotton grass. In the middle of it rose two great stones, worn and sharpened at the upper end, until they looked like the huge corroding fangs of some monstrous beast. In every way it corresponded with the scene of the old tragedy. Sir Henry was much interested, and asked Stapleton more than once whether he did really believe in the possibility of the interference of the supernatural in the affairs of men. He spoke lightly, but it was evident that he was very much in earnest. Stapleton was guarded in his replies, but it was easy to see that he had said less than he might and that he would not express his whole opinion out of consideration for the feelings of the baronet. He told us of similar cases, where families had suffered from some evil influence, and he left us with the impression that he shared the popular view upon the matter. 
and on our way back we stayed for lunch at Merriton House, and it was there that Sir Henry made the acquaintance of Miss Stapleton. From the first moment that he saw her, he appeared to be strongly attracted by her, and I am much mistaken if the feeling was not mutual. He referred to her again and again on our walk home, and since then hardly a day has passed that we have not seen something of the brother and sister. They dine here to-night, and there is some talk of our going to them next week. One would imagine that such a match would be very welcome to Stapleton, and yet I have more than once caught a look of the strongest disapprobation in his face when Sir Henry has been paying some attention to his sister. He is much attached to her, no doubt, and would lead a lonely life without her, but it would seem the height of selfishness if he were to stand in the way of her making so brilliant a marriage. Yet I am certain that he does not wish their intimacy to ripen into love, and I have several times observed that he has taken pains to prevent them from being tete-a-tete. By the way, your instructions to me never to allow Sir Henry to get out alone will become very much more onerous if a love affair were to be added to our other difficulties. My popularity would soon suffer if I were to carry out your orders to the letter. The other day, uh, Thursday to be more exact, Dr. Mortimer lunched with us. He has been excavating a barrow at Longdown, and has got a prehistoric skull which fills him with great joy. Never was there such a single-minded enthusiast as he. The Stapletons came in afterwards, and the good doctor took us all to the U Alley, at Sir Henry's request, to show us exactly how everything occurred upon that fatal night. It is a long, dismal walk, the U Alley, between two high walls of clipped hedge with a narrow band of grass upon either side. At the far end is an old tumble-down summer-house. Halfway down is the moor-gate, where the old gentleman left his cigar-ash. It is a white wooden gate with a latch. Beyond it lies the wide moor. I remembered your theory of the affair, and tried to picture all that had occurred. As the old man stood there, he saw something coming across the moor, something which terrified him so that he lost his wits, and ran and ran until he died, of sheer horror and exhaustion. There was the long, gloomy tunnel down which he fled. And from what? A sheep-dog of the moor? Or a spectral hound, black, silent, and monstrous? Was there a human agency in the matter? Did the pale, watchful Barrymore know more than he cared to say? It was all dim and vague, but always there is the dark shadow of crime behind it. One other neighbor I have met since I wrote last. This is Mr. Franklin of Laughter Hall, who lives some four miles to the south of us. He is an elderly man, red-faced, white-haired, and choleric. His passion is for the British law, and he has spent a large fortune in litigation. He fights for the mere pleasure of fighting, and is equally ready to take up either side of a question, so that it is no wonder that he has found it a costly amusement. Sometimes he will shut up a right-of-way and defy the parish to make him open it. At others he will, with his own hands, tear down some other man's gate and declare that a path has existed there from time immemorial, defying the owner to prosecute him for trespass. He is learned in old manorial and communal rights, and he applies his knowledge sometimes in favor of the villagers of Fernworthy, and sometimes against them, so that he is periodically either carried in triumph down the village street, or else burned in effigy, according to his latest exploit. He is said to have about seven lawsuits upon his hands at present, which will probably swallow up the remainder of his fortune, and so draw his steam and leave him harmless for the future. Apart from the law, he seems a kindly good-natured person, and I only mention him because you were particular that I should send some description of the people who surround us. 
He is curiously employed at present, for, being an amateur astronomer, he has an excellent telescope, with which he lies upon the roof of his own house, and sweeps the moor all day in the hope of catching a glimpse of the escaped continent. If he would confine his energies to this, all would be well. But there are rumours that he intends to prosecute Dr. Mortimer for opening a grave without the consent of the next of kin, because he dug up the Neolithic skull in the barrow on Long Down. He helps to keep our lives from being monotonous, and gives a little comic relief where it is badly needed. And now, having brought you up to date in the escaped convict, the Stapletons, Dr. Mortimer, and Franklin of Laughter Hall, let me end on that which is most important, and tell you more about the Barrymores, and especially about the surprising development of last night. First of all, about the test telegram, which you sent from London in order to make sure that Barrymore was really here. I have already explained that the testimony of the postmaster shows that the test was worthless, and that we have no proof one way or the other. I told Sir Henry how the matter stood, and he at once, in his downright fashion, had Barrymore up and asked him whether he had received the telegram himself. Barrymore said that he had. "'Did the boy deliver it into your own hands?' asked Sir Henry. Barrymore looked surprised, and considered for a little time. "'No,' said he. "'I was in the box-room at the time and my wife brought it up to me. Did you answer it yourself? No. I told my wife what to answer, and she went down to write it. In the evening he recurred to the subject of his own accord. I, I could not understand the object of your questions this morning, Sir Henry, said he. I trust that they do not mean that I have done anything to forfeit your confidence. Sir Henry had to assure him that it was not so, and pacify him by giving him a considerable part of his old wardrobe, the London outfit having now all arrived. Mrs. Barrymore is of interest to me. She is a heavy, solid person, very limited, intensely respectable, and inclined to be puritanical. You could hardly conceive a less emotional subject. Yet I have told you how, on the first night here, I heard her sobbing bitterly, and since then I have more than once observed traces of tears upon her face. Some deep sorrow gnaws ever at her heart. Sometimes I wonder if she has a guilty memory, which haunts her, and sometimes I suspect Barrymore of being a domestic tyrant. I have always felt that there was something singular and questionable in this man's character, but the adventure of last night brings all my suspicions to a head. And yet it may seem a small matter in itself. You are aware that I am not a very sound sleeper, and since I have been on guard in this house my slumbers have been lighter than ever. Last night, about two in the morning, I was aroused by a stealthy step passing my room. I rose, opened my door, and peeped out. A long black shadow was trailing down the corridor. It was thrown by a man, who walked softly down the passage with a candle held in his hand. He was in shirt and trousers, with no covering to his feet. I could merely see the outline, but his height told me it was Barrymore. He walked very slowly and circumspectly and there was something indescribably guilty and furtive in his whole appearance. I have told you that the corridor is broken by the balcony which runs round the hall, but that it is resumed upon the farther side. I waited until he had passed out of sight, and then I followed him. When I came round the balcony, he had reached the end of the farther corridor. I could see from the glimmer of light through an open door that he had entered one of the rooms. Now, all these rooms are unfurnished and unoccupied, so that his expedition became more mysterious than ever. The light shone steadily, as if he were standing motionless. I crept down the passage as noiselessly as I could, 
and peeped round the corner of the door. Barrymore was crouching at the window with his candle held against the glass. His profile was half turned towards me, and his face seemed to be rigid with expectation as he stared out into the blackness of the moor. For some minutes he stood, watching intently. Then he gave a deep groan, and with an impatient gesture he put out the light. Instantly I made my way back to my room and very shortly came the stealthy steps passing once more upon their return journey. Long afterwards, when I had fallen into a light sleep, I heard a key turn somewhere in a lock, but I could not tell whence the sound came. What it all means I cannot guess, but there is some secret business going on in this house of gloom which sooner or later we shall get to the bottom of. I do not trouble you with my theories, for you asked me to furnish you only with facts. I have had a long talk with Sir Henry this morning, and we have made a plan of campaign, founded upon my observations of last night. I will not speak about it just now, but it should make my next report interesting reading. End of chapter 8 Chapter Nine of *The Hound of the Baskervilles* by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Newfell. Chapter Nine, Second Report of Doctor Watson, The Light Upon the Moor. Baskerville Hall, October fifteenth. My dear Mister Holmes. If I was compelled to leave you without much news during the early days of my mission, you must acknowledge that I am making up for lost time, and that events are now crowding thick and fast upon us. In my last report I ended upon my top note with Barrymore at the window, and now I have quite a budget already which will, unless I am much mistaken, considerably surprise you. Things have taken a turn which I could not have anticipated. In some ways they have, within the last forty-eight hours, become much clearer, and in some ways they have become more complicated. But I will tell you all, and you shall judge for yourself. Before breakfast on the morning following my adventure, I went down the corridor and examined the room in which Barrymore had been the night before. The western window through which he had stared so intently has, I noticed, one peculiarity above all other windows in the house. It commands the nearest outlook on the moor. There is an opening between two trees which enables one from this point of view to look right down upon it, while from all the other windows it is only a distant glimpse which can be obtained. It follows, therefore, that Barrymore since only this window would serve the purpose, must have been looking out for something or somebody upon the moor. The night was very dark, so that I can hardly imagine how he could have hoped to see anyone. It had struck me that it was possible that some love intrigue was on foot. That would have accounted for his stealthy movements, and also for the uneasiness of his wife. The man is a striking-looking fellow, very well equipped to steal the heart of a country girl, so that this theory seemed to have something to support it. That opening of the door which I had heard after I returned to my room might mean that he had gone out to keep some clandestine appointment. So I reasoned with myself in the morning, and I tell you the direction of my suspicions, however much the result may have shown that they were unfounded but whenever the true explanation of Barrymore's movements might be, I felt that the responsibility of keeping them to myself until I could explain them was more than I could bear. I had an interview with the baronet in his study after breakfast, and I told him all that I had seen. He was less surprised than I had expected. I knew that Barrymore walked about nights, and I had a mind to speak to him about it, said he. Two or three times I have heard his steps in the passage, coming and going, just about the hour you name. 
"'Perhaps, then, he pays a visit every night to that particular window,' I suggested. "'Perhaps he does. If so, we should be able to shadow him, and see what it is that he is after. I wonder what your friend Holmes would do if he were here.' "'I believe that he would do exactly what you now suggest,' said I. "'He would follow Barrymore and see what he did.' "'Then we shall do it together.' Oh, but surely he would hear us. The man is rather deaf, and in any case we must take our chance of that. We'll sit up in my room tonight and wait till he passes. Sir Henry rubbed his hands with pleasure, and it was evident that he hailed the adventure as a relief to his somewhat quiet life upon the moor. The baronet has been in communication with the architect who prepared the plans for Sir Charles, and with a contractor from London, so that we may expect great changes to begin here soon. There have been decorators and furnishers up from Plymouth, and it is evident that our friend has large ideas, and means to spare no pains or expense to restore the grandeur of his family. When the house is renovated and refurnished, all that he will need will be a wife to make it complete. Between ourselves there are pretty clear signs that this will not be wanting if the lady is willing, for I have seldom seen a man more infatuated with a woman than he is with our beautiful neighbor, Miss Stapleton. And yet the course of true love does not run quite as smoothly as one would under the circumstances expect. Today, for example, its surface was broken by a very unexpected ripple, which has caused our friend considerable perplexity and annoyance. After the conversation which I have quoted about Barrymore, Sir Henry put on his hat and prepared to go out. As a matter of course, I did the same. "'What? Are you coming, Watson?' he asked, looking at me in a curious way. Oh, "'That depends on whether you are going on the moor.' said I. Yes, I am. Well, you know what my instructions are. I am sorry to intrude, but you heard how earnestly Holmes insisted that I should not leave you, and especially that you should not go alone upon the moor. Sir Henry put his hand upon my shoulder with a pleasant smile. My dear fellow, said he, Holmes, with all his wisdom, did not foresee some things which have happened since I have been on the moor. You understand me? I am sure that you are the last man in the world who would wish to be a spoil-sport. I must go out alone. It put me in a most awkward position. I was at a loss what to say or what to do, and before I made up my mind he picked up his cane and was gone. But when I came to think the matter over, my conscience reproached me bitterly for having on any pretext allowed him to go out of my sight. I imagined what my feelings would be if I had to return to you and to confess that some misfortune had occurred through my disregard for your instructions. I assure you my cheeks flushed at the very thought. It might not even now be too late to overtake him so I set off at once in the direction of Merripit House. I hurried along the road at the top of my speed, without seeing anything of Sir Henry, until I came to the point where the moor path branches off. There, fearing that perhaps I had come in the wrong direction after all, I mounted a hill from which I could command a view, the same hill which is cut into the dark quarry. Thence I saw him at once. He was on the moor-path, about a quarter of a mile off, and a lady was by his side who could only be Miss Stapleton. It was clear that there was already an understanding between them, and that they had met by appointment. They were walking slowly along in deep conversation, and I saw her making quick little movements of her hands, as if she were very earnest in what she was saying, while he listened intently and once or twice shook his head in strong dissent. I stood among the rocks watching them, very much puzzled as to what I should do next. To follow them and break into their intimate conversation seemed to be an outrage. 
and yet my clear duty was never for an instant to let him out of my sight. To act the spy upon a friend was a hateful task. Still, I could see no better course than to observe him from the hill, and to clear my conscience by confessing to him afterwards what I had done. It is true that, if any sudden danger had threatened him, I was too far away to be of use, and yet I am sure that you will agree with me that the position was very difficult, and that there was nothing more which I could do. Our friend Sir Henry and the lady had halted on the path, and were standing deeply absorbed in their conversation, when I was suddenly aware that I was not the only witness of their interview. A wisp of green floating in the air caught my eye, and another glance showed me that it was carried on a stick by a man who was moving among the broken ground. It was Stapleton with his butterfly net. He was very much closer to the pair than I was, and he appeared to be moving in their direction. At this instant Sir Henry suddenly drew Miss Stapleton to his side. His arm was around her but it seemed to me that she was straining away from him with her face averted. He stooped his head to hers, and she raised one hand, as if in protest. Next moment I saw them spring apart, and turn hurriedly around. Stapleton was the cause of the interruption. He was running wildly towards them, his absurd net dangling behind him. He gesticulated and almost danced with excitement in front of the lovers. What the scene meant I could not imagine, but it seemed to me that Stapleton was abusing Sir Henry, who offered explanations, which became more angry as the other refused to accept them. The lady stood by in haughty silence. Finally, Stapleton turned upon his heel and beckoned in a peremptory way to his sister, who, after an irresolute glance at Sir Henry, walked off by the side of her brother. The naturalist's angry gestures showed that the lady was included in his displeasure. The baronet stood for a minute looking after them, and then he walked slowly back the way that he had come, his head hanging, the very picture of dejection. What all this meant I could not imagine, but I was deeply ashamed to have witnessed so intimate a scene without my friend's knowledge. I ran down the hill, therefore, and met the baronet at the bottom. His face was flushed with anger, and his brows were wrinkled, like one who is at his wit's ends what to do. "'Hullo, Watson. Where have you dropped from?' said he. "'You don't mean to say that you came after me in spite of all?' I explained everything to him how I had found it impossible to remain behind, how I had followed him, and how I had witnessed all that had occurred. For an instant his eyes blazed at me, but my frankness disarmed his anger, and he broke at last into a rather rueful laugh. <sighs> you would have thought the middle of that prairie a fairly safe place for a man to be private, said he. But, by thunder, the whole countryside seems to have been out to see me do my wooing, and a mighty poor wooing at that. Where had you engaged a seat? I was on that hill. Quite in the back row, eh? But her brother was well up to the front. Did you see him come out on us? Yes, I did. Did he ever strike you as being crazy, this brother of hers? I can't say that he ever did. I dare say not. I always thought him sane enough, till today. But you can take it from me that either he or I ought to be in a straitjacket. What's the matter with me, anyhow? You've lived near me for some weeks, Watson. Tell me straight now. Is there anything that would prevent me from making a good husband to a woman that I loved? Well, I should say not. He can't object to my worldly position, so it must be myself that he has this down on. What has he against me? I never hurt man or woman in my life that I know of. And yet he would not so much as let me touch the tips of her fingers. 
Did he say so? That and a deal more. I tell you, Watson, I've only known her these few weeks, but from the first I just felt that she was made for me, and she too. She was happy when she was with me, and that I'll swear. There's a light in a woman's eyes that speaks louder than words. But he has never let us get together, and it is only today, for the first time, that I saw a chance of having a few words with her alone. She was glad to meet me, but when she did, it was not love that she would talk about, and she wouldn't have let me talk about it either, if she could have stopped it. She kept coming back to it that this was a place of danger, and that she would never be happy until I had left it. I told her that, since I had seen her, I was in no hurry to leave it and that if she really wanted me to go, the only way to work it was for her to arrange to go with me. With that I offered in as many words to marry her. But before she could answer, down came this brother of hers, running at us with a face on him like a madman. He was just white with rage, and those light eyes of his were blazing with fury. What was I doing with the lady? How dared I offer her attentions which were distasteful to her? Did I think that because I was a baronet I could do what I liked? If he had not been her brother, I should have known better how to answer him. As it was, I told him that my feelings towards her sister were such as I was not ashamed of, and that I hoped that she might honor me by becoming my wife. That seemed to make the matter no better, so then I lost my temper too and I answered him rather more hotly than I should, perhaps, considering that she was standing by. So it ended by his going off with her, as you saw, and here am I as badly puzzled a man as any in this county. Just tell me what it all means, Watson, and I'll owe you more than ever I can hope to pay. I tried one or two explanations, but, indeed, I was completely puzzled myself. Our friend's title, his fortune, his age, his character, and his appearance are all in his favour, and I know nothing against him unless it be this dark fate which runs in his family. That his advances should be rejected so brusquely without any reference to the lady's own wishes and that the lady should accept the situation without protest is very amazing. However, our conjectures were set at rest by a visit from Stapleton himself that very afternoon. He had come to offer apologies for his rudeness of the morning, and after a long private interview with Sir Henry and his study, the upshot of their conversation was that the breach is quite healed and that we are to dine at Merripit House next Friday, as a sign of it. "'I don't say now that he isn't a crazy man,' said Sir Henry. "'I can't forget the look in his eyes when he ran at me this morning, but I must allow that no man could make a more handsome apology than he has done. Did he give any explanation of his conduct? "'His sister is everything in his life,' he says. That is natural enough, and I am glad that he should understand her value. They have always been together, and according to his account, he has been a very lonely man with only her as a companion, so that the thought of losing her was really terrible to him. He had not understood, he said, that I was becoming attached to her, but when he saw with his own eyes that it was really so, and that she might be taken away from him, it gave him such a shock that, for a time, he was not responsible for what he said or did. He was very sorry for all that had passed, and he recognized how foolish and how selfish it was that he could imagine that he could hold a beautiful woman like his sister to himself for her whole life. If she had to leave him, he had rather it was to a neighbor like myself than to anyone else. But, in any case, it was a blow to him and it would take him some time before he could prepare himself to meet it. He would withdraw all opposition upon his part if I would promise for three months to let the matter rest, and to be content with cultivating the lady's friendship during that time without claiming her love. This I promised, 
and so the matter rests. So there is one of our small mysteries cleared up. It is something to have touched bottom anywhere in this bog in which we are floundering. We know now why Stapleton looked with disfavour upon his sister's suitor, even when that suitor was so eligible a one as Sir Henry. And now I pass on to another thread which I have extricated out of the tangled skein, the mystery of the sobs in the night, of the tear-stained face of Mrs. Barrymore, of the secret journey of the butler to the western lattice window. Congratulate me, my dear Holmes, and tell me that I have not disappointed you as an agent, that you do not regret the confidence which you showed in me when you sent me down. All these things have by one night's work been thoroughly clear. I have said by one night's work, but in truth it was by two nights' work, for on the first we drew entirely blank. I sat up with Sir Henry in his rooms until nearly three o'clock in the morning, but no sound of any sort did we hear except the chiming clock upon the stairs. It was a most melancholy vigil, and ended by each of us falling asleep in our chairs. Fortunately we were not discouraged, and we determined to try again. The next night we lowered the lamp, and sat smoking cigarettes without making the least sound. It was incredible how slowly the hours crawled by, and yet we were helped through it by the same sort of patient interest which the hunter must feel as he watches the trap into which he hopes the game will wander. One struck, and two, and we had almost for the second time given it up in despair, when in an instant we both sat bolt upright in our chairs, with all our weary senses keenly on the alert once more. We had heard the creak of a step in the passage. Very stealthily we heard it pass along until it died away in the distance. Then the baronet gently opened his door, and we set out in pursuit. Already our man had gone round the gallery, and the corridor was all in darkness. Softly we stole along until we had come into the other wing. We were just in time to catch a glimpse of the tall, black-bearded figure, his shoulders rounded, as he tiptoed down the passage. Then he passed through the same door as before, and the light of the candle framed it in the darkness and shot one single yellow beam across the gloom of the corridor. We shuffled cautiously towards it, trying every plank before we dared to put our whole weight upon it. We had taken the precaution of leaving our boots behind us, but even so, the old boards snapped and creaked beneath our tread. Sometimes it seemed impossible that he should fail to hear our approach. However, the man is fortunately rather deaf and he was entirely preoccupied in that which he was doing. When at last we reached the door and peeped through, we found him crouching at the window, candle in hand, his white, intent face pressed against the pane, exactly as I had seen him two nights before. We had arranged no plan of campaign, but the baronet is a man to whom the most direct way is always the most natural. He walked into the room, and as he did so, Barrymore sprang up from the window with a sharp hiss of his breath, and stood livid and trembling before us. His dark eyes, flaring out of the white mask of his face, were full of horror and astonishment as he gazed from Sir Henry to me. "'What are you doing here, Barrymore?' "'Nothing, sir.' His agitation was so great that he could hardly speak and the shadows sprang up and down from the shaking of his candle. It was the window, sir. I go round at night to see that they are fastened. On the second floor? Yes, sir, all the windows. Look here, Barrymore, said Sir Henry sternly. We have made up our minds to have the truth out of you, so it will save you trouble to tell it sooner rather than later. Come now. No lies. What were you doing at that window? The fellow looked at us in a helpless way, and he wrung his hands together like one who was in the last extremity of doubt and misery. 
I was doing no harm, sir. I was holding a candle to the window. And why were you holding a candle to the window? Don't ask me, Sir Henry. Don't ask me. I give you my word, sir, that it is not my secret, and that I cannot tell it. If it concerned no one but myself, I would not try to keep it from you. A sudden idea occurred to me, and I took the candle from the trembling hand of the butler. He must have been holding it as a signal, said I. Let us see if there is any answer. I held it as he had done, and stared out into the darkness of the night. Vaguely I could discern the black bank of the trees and the lighter expanse of the moor, for the moon was behind the clouds. And then I gave a cry of exultation, for a tiny pinpoint of yellow light had suddenly transfixed the dark veil and glowed steadily in the center of the black square framed by the window. "'There it is!' I cried. "'No, no, sir, it is nothing, nothing at all,' the butler broke in. "'I assure you, sir, move your light across the window, Watson,' cried the baronet. "'See, the other moves also.' Now, you rascal, do you deny that it is a signal? Come, speak up. Who is your confederate out yonder, and what is this conspiracy that is going on? The man's face became openly defiant. It is my business, and not yours. I will not tell. Then you leave my employment right away. Very good, sir. If I must, I must and you go in disgrace. By thunder you may well be ashamed of yourself. Your family has lived with mine for over a hundred years under this roof, and here I find you deep in some dark plot against me. No, no, sir, no, not against you. It was a woman's voice, and Mrs. Barrymore, paler and more horror-struck than her husband, was standing at the door. Her bulky figure in a shawl and skirt might have been comic, were it not for the intensity of feeling upon her face. We have to go, Eliza. This is the end of it. You can pack our things, said the butler. Oh, John, John, have I brought you to this? It is my doing, Sir Henry, all mine. He has done nothing except for my sake, and because I asked him. Speak out, then. What does it mean? My unhappy brother is starving on the moor. We cannot let him perish at our very gates. The light is a signal to him that food is ready for him, and his light out yonder is to show the spot to which to bring him. And your brother is. The escaped convict, sir, Selden, the criminal. That's the truth, sir, said Barrymore. I said that it was not my secret, and that I could not tell it to you. But now you have heard it, and you will see that if there was a plot, it was not against you. This, then, was the explanation of the stealthy expeditions at night and the light at the window. Sir Henry and I both stared at the woman in amazement. Was it possible that this stolidly respectable person was of the same blood as one of the most notorious criminals in the country? Yes, sir. My name is Selden, and he is my younger brother. We humored him too much when he was a lad, and gave him his own way in everything, until he came to think that the world was made for his pleasure and that he could do what he liked. Then, as he grew older, he met wicked companions, and the devil entered into him, until he broke my mother's heart and dragged our name in the dirt. From crime to crime he sank lower and lower, until it is only the mercy of God which has snatched him from the scaffold. But to me, sir, he was always the little curly-headed boy that I had nursed and played with as an elder sister would. That is why he broke prison, sir. He knew that I was here, and that we could not refuse to help him. 
when he dragged himself here one night, weary and starving, with the warders hard at his heels, what could we do? We took him in and fed him and, and cared for him. Then you returned, sir, and my brother thought he would be safer on the moor than anywhere else until the hue and cry was over. So he lay in hiding there. But every second night we made sure if he was still there by putting a light in the window. And if there was an answer, my husband took out some bread and meat to him. Every day we hoped that he was gone, but as long as he was there we could not desert him. That is the whole truth, as I am an honest Christian woman, and you will see that if there is blame in the matter, it does not lie with my husband, but with me, for whose sake he has done all that he has. The woman's words came with an intense earnestness which carried conviction with them. Is this true, Barrymore? Yes, Sir Henry, every word of it. Well, I cannot blame you for standing by your own wife. Forget what I have said. Go to your room, you two, and we shall talk further about this matter in the morning. When they were gone, we looked out of the window again. Sir Henry had flung it open, and the cold night wind beat in upon our faces. Far away, in the black distance, there still glowed that one tiny point of yellow light. "'I wonder he dares,' said Sir Henry. "'It may be so placed as to be only visible from here.' "'Very likely. How far do you think it is?' "'Out by the cleft tor, I think. Not more than a mile or two off. Hardly that. Well, it cannot be far if Barrymore had to carry out the food to it. And he is waiting, this villain, beside that candle. By thunder, Watson, I am going out to take that man. The same thought had crossed my own mind. It was not as if the Barrymores had taken us into their confidence. Their secret had been forced from them. The man was a danger to the community, an unmitigated scoundrel for whom there was neither pity nor excuse. We were only doing our duty in taking this chance of putting him back where he could do no harm. With his brutal and violent nature, others would have to pay the price if we held our hands. Any night, for example, our neighbors, the Stapletons, might be attacked by him, and it may have been the thought of this which made Sir Henry so keen upon the adventure. "'I will come,' said I. "'Then get your revolver and put on your boots. The sooner we start, the better, as the fellow may put out his light and be off.' In five minutes we were outside the door, starting upon our expedition. We hurried through the dark shrubbery, amid the dull moaning of the autumn wind and the rustling of the falling leaves. The night air was heavy with the smell of damp and decay. Now and again the moon peeped out for an instant, but clouds were driving over the face of the sky, and just as we came out on the moor a thin rain began to fall. The light still burned steadily in front. "'Are you armed?' I asked. "'I have a hunting crop. We must close in on him rapidly, for he is said to be a desperate fellow. We shall take him by surprise, and have him at our mercy before he can resist.' "'I say, Watson,' said the baronet, "'what would Holmes say to this? How about that hour of darkness in which the power of evil is exalted?' As if in answer to his words, there rose suddenly out of the vast gloom of the moor that strange cry which I had already heard upon the borders of the great Grimpen Mire. It came with the wind through the silence of the night, a long, deep mutter, then a rising howl, and then the sad moan in which it died away. Again and again it sounded, the whole air throbbing with it, strident, wild, and menacing. The baronet caught my sleeve, and his face glimmered white through the darkness. "'My God, what's that, Watson?' "'I don't know. It's a sound they have on the moor. I heard it once before.' It died away, 
and an absolute silence closed in upon us. We stood straining our ears, but nothing came. "'Watson,' said the baronet, "'it was the cry of a hound.' My blood ran cold in my veins for there was a break in his voice which told of the sudden horror which had seized him. "'What do they call this sound?' he asked. "'Who?' "'The folk on the countryside.' "'Oh, well, they are ignorant people. Why should you mind what they call it? Tell me, Watson, what do they say of it?' I hesitated, but could not escape the question. They say it is the cry of the hound of the Baskervilles. He groaned and was silent for a few moments. A hound it was, he said at last, but it seemed to come from miles away, over yonder, I think. It was hard to say whence it came. It rose and fell with the wind. Isn't that the direction of the great Grimpen Mire? Yes, it is. Well, it was up there. Come now, Watson, didn't you think yourself that it was the cry of a hound? I am not a child. You need not fear to speak the truth. Stapleton was with me when I heard it last. He said that it might be the calling of a strange bird. No, no, it was a hound. My God, can there be some truth in all these stories? Is it possible that I am really in danger from so dark a cause? You don't believe it, do you, Watson? No, no. And yet it was one thing to laugh about it in London, and it is another to stand out here in the darkness of the moor and to hear such a cry as that. And my uncle! There was the footprint of the hound beside him as he lay. It all fits together. I don't think that I am a coward, Watson, but that sound seems to freeze my very blood. Feel my hand. It was as cold as a block of marble. You'll be all right tomorrow. I don't think that I'll get that cry out of my head. What do you advise that we do now? Oh, shall we turn back? No, by thunder! We have come out to get our man, and we will do it. We after the convict, and a hell-hound, as likely as not, after us. Come on. We'll see it through if all the fiends of the pit were loose upon the moor. We stumbled slowly along in the darkness, with the black loom of the craggy hills around us, and the yellow speck of light burning steadily in front. There is nothing so deceptive as the distance of a light upon a pitch-dark night, and sometimes the glimmer seems to be far away upon the horizon, and sometimes it might have been within a few yards of us. But at last we could see whence it came, and then we knew that we were indeed very close. A guttering candle was stuck in a crevice of the rocks, which flanked it on each side so as to keep the wind from it and also to prevent it from being visible, save in the direction of Baskerville Hall. A boulder of granite concealed our approach, and crouching behind it, we gazed over it at the signal light. It was strange to see this single candle burning there in the middle of the moor, with no sign of life near it, just the one straight yellow flame and the gleam of the rock on each side of it. What shall we do now? whispered Sir Henry. Wait here. He must be near his light. Let us see if we can get a glimpse of him. My words were hardly out of my mouth when we both saw him. Over the rocks, in the crevice of which the candle burned, there was thrust out an evil yellow face, a terrible animal face, all seamed and scored with vile passions foul with mire with a bristling beard and hung with matted hair it might well have belonged to one of those old savages who dwelt in the burrows on the hillsides the light beneath him was reflected in his small cunning eyes which peered fiercely to right and left through the darkness like a crafty and savage animal who has heard the steps of the hunters 
something had evidently aroused his suspicions. It may have been that Barrymore had some private signal which he had neglected to give, or the fellow may have had some other reason for thinking that all was not well, but I could read his fears upon his wicked face. Any instant he might dash out of the light and vanish in the darkness. I sprang forward, therefore, and Sir Henry did the same. At the same moment the convict screamed out a curse at us, and hurled a rock, which splintered up against the boulder which had sheltered us. I caught one glimpse of his short, squat, strongly built figure as he sprang to his feet and turned to run. At the same moment, by a lucky chance, the moon broke through the clouds. We rushed over the brow of the hill, and there was our man running with great speed down the other side, springing over the stones in his way with the activity of a mountain goat. A lucky long shot of my revolver might have crippled him, but I had brought it only to defend myself if attacked, and not to shoot an unarmed man who was running away. We were both swift runners and in fairly good training, but we soon found that we had no chance of overtaking him. We saw him for a long time in the moonlight, until he was only a small speck moving swiftly among the boulders upon the side of a distant hill. We ran and ran until we were completely blown, but the space between us grew ever wider. Finally we stopped and sat panting on two rocks, while we watched him disappearing in the distance. And it was at this moment that there occurred a most strange and unexpected thing. We had risen from our rocks and were turning to go home, having abandoned the hopeless chase. The moon was low upon the right, and the jagged pinnacle of a granite tor stood up against the lower curve of its silver disk. There, outlined as black as an ebony statue on that shining background, I saw the figure of a man upon the tor. Do not think it was a delusion, Holmes. I assure you that I have never in my life seen anything more clearly. As far as I could judge, the figure was that of a tall, thin man. He stood with his legs a little separated, his arms folded, his head bowed, as if he were brooding over that enormous wilderness of peat and granite which lay before him. He might have been the very spirit of that terrible place. It was not the convict. This man was far from the place where the latter had disappeared. Besides, he was a much taller man. With a cry of surprise, I pointed him out to the baronet, but in the instant during which I had turned to grasp his arm, the man was gone. There was the sharp pinnacle of granite still cutting the lower edge of the moon, but its peak bore no trace of that silent and motionless figure. I wished to go in that direction and to search the tour, but it was some distance away. The baronet's nerves were still quivering from that cry, which recalled the dark story of his family, and he was not in the mood for fresh adventures. He had not seen this lonely man upon the tour, and could not feel the thrill which his strange presence and his commanding attitude had given to me. "'A warder, no doubt,' said he. The moor has been thick with them since this fellow escaped. Well, perhaps his explanation may be the right one, but I should like to have some further proof of it. Today we mean to communicate to the Provincetown people where they should look for their missing man. But it is hard lines that we have not actually had the triumph of bringing him back as our own prisoner. Such are the adventures of last night, and you must acknowledge, my dear Holmes, that I have done you very well in the matter of a report. Much of what I tell you is no doubt quite irrelevant, but still I feel that it is best that I should let you have all the facts, and leave you to select for yourself those which will be of most service to you in helping you to your conclusion. We are certainly making some progress. So far as the Barrymores go, we have found the motive of their actions, and that has cleared up the situation very much. But the moor, with its mysteries and its strange inhabitants, remains as inscrutable as ever. Perhaps in my next I may be able to throw some light upon this also. 
best of all would it be if you could come down to us. In any case, you will hear from me again in the course of the next few days. End of chapter 9